So hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, welcome to our MS Academy seminar um, and thank you all for joining us um, today. So today we're going to uh, discuss about management of MS um, uh, in patients with, uh, management of patients with MS in, pre in pregnancy um, when they have their DNTs. We all know that um, MS affects um, women of childbearing age um, and the majority of patients um, on the, at the time of diagnosis, they would have not completed their families. So we really want to welcome our speakers today. We're gonna to go through preconception counseling, discussing the management of active MS and, and the DMTs during pregnancy. And, and then we're gonna have a, a, a discussion at the end about how we establish a collaborative working between uh, the MS and maternity services. So I'd really like to um, welcome um, uh, Dr. Karen Chung, a consultant neurologist at the National Hospital. Um, Karen is a consultant neurologist with specialist interest in MS um, and has also got a special interest in preconception and obstetric care in patients with MS. Well, thank you, Karen, uh, over to you. So thank you very much, um, Azza, and to the MS Academy for inviting me to uh, take part in this webinar. Um, as as has mentioned, I am a consultant neurologist with a specialist interest in MS at Queen Square, and I personally have an interest in preconception counselling and how to support our female patients who are considering family planning. And it's, it's quite exciting because you, we used to have very little options, and you know you you sometimes meet patients who are diagnosed 30 years ago and they will be told things like oh maybe you know if you don't want to have a family desperately then don't or they have to come off treatment if there was any treatment and you know, what's amazing when I thought about this talk today is that we're in a position to have a whole chat about it to have options which is really quite remarkable and really shows how far we have come in in the management of, of MS. So um this sort of decision-making model in DMTs uh, shouldn't be too unfamiliar to, to most of you in the audience. And you know, there are many factors to consider when you are making a decision with a patient about uh, which DMT to embark on, whether it's first line or, or subsequent therapies. So I put here br briefly that the key factors that I consider in, in any MS patient would be of course, underlying disease activity. There's a huge spectrum of long-term outcomes in MS and how active people's diseases are. And therefore this will indirectly um, or directly uh, guide what, um, what DMTs they're eligible for, which will vary between countries, but in the UK we have quite clear NHS England eligibility criteria. Things like mode of delivery, where some patients would say absolute no to a certain form of, of uh, medications, whether they have any comorbidities, which will impact our decision making, how risk averse the individual is. You know, we've all met patients who, despite quite active disease, does not want to have any treatment. And you also have patients who would opt to have higher efficacy treatment, even after you know, one or two minor or smaller relapses. And um, things like lifestyle, how, how busy they are, how active, what's their family life, and the monitoring requirement. And so that's just for any MS patient. And then if you factor in family planning, um, wait, let me just... So family planning is similar, but then you have additional factors to think about, which clearly is being female, but also age and fertility. It can be quite a tricky, decision to a discussion to have. Um, I think in this respect, being female potentially helps that in, in patients who are mid to late 30s, even early 40s, I can be quite frank and say, you know, fertility have shown to sort of reduce and therefore we, we should make decisions you know, soon. Um, why is pregnancy um, treatment decisions always tricky? Well, because it's unethical and we can't do trials on patients who are pregnant. So therefore any data we have is purely from real world data where we accumulate um, enough number of drug exposed pregnancies. And therefore it's not surprising that the oldest DMTs are the ones that we have most confidence and data in. And because usually there's a threshold beyond, we need about a thousand drug exposed pregnancies to, to form some kind of uh, view uh, whether it is safe in pregnancy or so. So this is a very, very simplified overview. But in my head, when I talk to 
female patients considering family, family planning, there's sort of two categories. One is the continuous therapy category versus the induction therapy side. The continuous therapy, as the name suggests, is a treatment that we give continuously before conception, the patient will continue treatment throughout pregnancy and usually continue beyond. And at the moment, the drugs that we are you know, deem safe to do them, um, and certainly on the SPC include uh, the first the first line platform injectables, meaning interferons and acetate. I think by now being uh, the earliest DMTs available since the 90s, we now have a wealth of data indicating that they are overall safe in pregnancy and they have been uh, factored in, in the SPCs. So that's sort of uh, straightforward for our lower disease activity patients. And then in more recent year, we're gaining more data and confidence in continuing treatment with natalizumab um, in, in patients with higher disease activity. Um, the current, that is not in the product, um, it's not in the SPC, so, but the current discussions to have will be um, as ever about risk benefit ratio, about whether um, what, what risk of rebound they will have if they were on Tysabri and they come off Tysabri. And if the decision is to continue it during pregnancy, then um, at Queensware, what we do is we aim for extended interval dosing, either six to eight weeks, and then not infusing beyond about 32 weeks or so because of associated hematological issues in the newborn. And we've had that with a number of patients that we're gaining more confidence in, in these patients and you know, liaising with the obstetrics team. So that's the continuous side. And the induction side, we're now lucky enough to have options where uh, there are drugs available, where the, the treatment uh, design is that they are given uh, the drugs early on in sort of in a simple way, cycle one and two in both cladribin and alemtuzumab. So there's a window opportunity where uh, a number of months beyond treatment, there's no ongoing drug toxicity, and that may be a good option for, for these patients. It's a bit dry just to talk about drugs and pros and cons individually, so it's always helpful to talk about a case. So I'm going to use um, a case that was um, provided to me by MSK Academy as, as a framework to talk about the sort of discussion that you have in the more active MS patient. So we have a 32 year old lady with rapidly evolving severe MS. So we know her background activity is high. Her first line DMT was natalizumab. She had this for four years and she was quite stable on this. However, her JCD index became higher to more than 1.5. And because of PML risks, she was switched to fingolimod three years ago. So when she was 29. She's now planning to start a family and has requested going back onto natalizumab for, for her pregnancy. And the question is, you know, what would you advise? So I think there's a very realistic scenario. I think most of us will have come across patients such as this before. And I think I'm pleased to say that in the past, you know, a few years ago, maybe five years ago, we would perhaps stop um, um, your DMT or go to an injectable. But I think things are changing a little bit. So going back to my previous factor consideration um, when it comes to decision making, let's go through some of the factors. Disease activity, well, she has active disease. We know that that's from the onset. She was eligible for natalizumab. So by definition, we'll expect that she is, um, has higher disease activity and would benefit from a DMT more than a higher FC DMT more than not. The second thing to consider is the current DMT. She's on fingolimod, and we know that fingolimod is a small molecule and that's not recommended and considered currently unsafe for pregnancy. And for people who are planning, we would advise a washout period. Uh, it differs between uh, centers, but at Queensware, we advise about two months um, washout before they will consider conceiving. And if they fall pregnant unplanned on fingolimod, we'll, we'll advise them to stop. So if she's hoping to have a family, then clearly the current DMT um, needs to be stopped. And then you think about things like 
potential risk of rebound, which is associated with a DMT such as sphingolimod. And the other thing to think about, which we don't know in this patient, but assume she has a degree of lymphopenia, which is common in sphingolimod, how long would the recovery be um, before we can potentially start another DMT? And I think going back to something that I think Lucy and Sarah will, will cover later about the importance of preconception counseling is, Perhaps at the age of 29, three years ago, you know, was Fingolomod the best DMT for her? And, um, you, you know, if this happened a number of years ago where there was very limited um, options, particularly with oral options, then maybe that was the best um, or most suitable DMT, or maybe she had personal reasons to go for it. But I think um, in a young female with potential to start a family, I personally probably wouldn't advise that nowadays, but that's a personal opinion. So then, key question. Um, so based on my talk, is what's next? What 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 was her next um, disease modifier therapy that will suit her? And what should we go for? So what you know? So fingalma is obviously not not suitable. Um, is is tisabrine, atalizumab suitable? Uh, potential um, potentially. So the thing that we consider you know, consider her is she stopped atalizumab. Uh, three years ago because of her PMR risk. So let's look at what her PMR risk is. So if she's JCV negative, that's you know, negligible. I think most of us will be, wouldn't have stopped her. She will have continued infusing. She, however, has a few uh, risk factors for, for higher PMR risk. So namely, her antibody index is more than 1.5. Um, what we do in our center is even though the antibody index may fluctuate, we take the highest recorded um, we have so to give the most conservative uh, risk estimation. She's now had um, three years of fingolimod treatment, so she's had additional immunosuppressant use. So that will put her PMR risk at about eight per a thousand. So that is less than one percent, and this will differ between individuals. But presumably, she is asking to go back to natalizumab, so she's not completely risk averse. I'll discuss the pros and cons with her. And I think in someone like her, uh, personally, I would be comfortable with her going on to natalizumab, certainly at least to cover um, the periods where she's going to have a family and then maybe consider you know, potentially switching even in the future. So going back to this slide, um, so I think natalizumab is a certainly a option. I think it's a good option. What alternatives are there? Well, we talked about um, the, you know, the two slides ago, the induction therapies, which in the current DMT menu will include cladribin and uh, alentuzumab. I think alentuzumab is, um, the use is much more, much more restricted now, and she technically hasn't um, had breakthrough disease on DMTs that she's been on, so she potentially would not be eligible. Um, but I think cladribin is, is another one that I would personally consider and discuss with her. Um, the benefits being that you can conceive six months after a dose, the last dose, so giving her a slight window. And she's 32, so she potentially can afford from a fertility point of view to finish cycles one and two, and then think about um, starting her family. Uh, the only thing that was put me off a little bit, which is unknown, is, is you know the degree of lymphopenia and, and how long she recovers from it because you would like that to be more um, towards the normal range, at least sort of around one or, or at least 0 0.8 before we'll consider starting her on cladribin. So we talked about a few things there, um, but um, you know, I, think, I think the things to remember is there are now many treatment options uh, for all MS patients, but particularly for women with MS who are considering pregnancy, which I think is remarkable. You know, I, I think it's very exciting to, to able to talk about options with, these, uh, with this patient group. Um, as mentioned, early discussion and preconception counseling are key, particularly if we're going to talk about switching treatment, particularly with induction therapies, we may need a little bit longer uh, before family planning is deemed um, more appropriate. I don't think there's always a right answer. As always with MS, it's always about risks versus benefits. And in this group of patients, you just have more factors to consider. Most importantly, we need more DMT exposed pregnancy data that will help inform future guidelines and practice. And we already have that with the ex existing 
um, injectables and atlizumab, which we are you know, practicing on a regular basis. So on that note, I would like to bring you all uh, attention to, to the MS Pregnancy Register, which has recently been established. And that is how we are hopefully going to collect um, data to give us a, a picture of how um, this, how we can best advise the patients. And um, if you're not aware of this, um, the UK Consensus on Pregnancy in MS, which was published two years ago in Practical Neurology, um, is open access. So I, I personally refer to this the whole time. It's a very helpful um, piece of document. And in your patients who are more engaged and want to be more informed, um, because of open access, I, I will sometimes guide them to, to it so they can um, be more engaged in their own care. On that note, many thanks for your attention and thank you again for inviting me. Thank you very much, Karen, for this really um, excellent talk and really nice um, update. Um, we will move now to our next speaker. I'd really like to welcome Lucy Lyons. Uh, hello, Lucy. Uh, Lucy is an advanced nurse practitioner, works with Karen um, at Queen Square, um, and Lucy is part of the MSMDT um, uh, and collaborative care and obstetric care in patients with MS. So thank you very much, Lucy. Lucy will be talking to us about preconception counselling. Over to you, Lucy. Lovely. Thank you, there, Asa, for the introduction, and, and thank you for the invitation um, to the MS Academy. And yes, yeah, so I work alongside Dr Chung at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery as an advanced nurse practitioner in multiple sclerosis. And part of my role is exploring kind of new pathways and setting up new clinics. And obviously since the pregnancy uh, sort of guideline in 2019, preconception counselling has, has very much been on everybody's radar. And, you know, the real importance of that, hopefully I'll talk about through this session. And my experience of this sort of topic and how I include that within my clinical practice and my role in sort of setting up a specialised sort of pregnancy pathway for our patient cohort. So first off, we have our own ideas about what we want to sort of include in a clinic and a service, but you know, we need to get sort of user engagement and need to kind of understand patient perspective of everything. So the clinic was really sort of set up in the pandemic. Um, so, you know, took hold of everything that we could do sort of virtually and sent a patient survey to a patient cohort that we had between sort of who gave birth between 2016 and 2020 to kind of understand sort of their experience of their obstetric pathway previously and how we could shape the service for sort of other women and sort of future people thinking about family planning. So some of the results from that survey is 71% felt that their maternity team were not adequately informed of MS and its effects on pregnancy. 93% would welcome access to a specialised service that considers preconception counselling, pregnancy and postpartum advice and support. So at this point we think, okay, the unmet need that we thought was there actually is echoed from our patient voice as well. And I think it's sort of really important that we have these discussions with them and have them as early as possible so that we can work alongside their existing timeline of family planning. We want all of our patients to achieve all of those life goals. And I think, you know, we can help uh, them sort of in their life sort of work out um, between all the different options that we now have available. And I also wanted to get a bit of an understanding of how they felt their, their care could be improved. So again, I think it's, it hits home a little bit more if it's come from a patient voice. So I asked the question, how could your pregnancy care have been improved from an MS perspective? So again, this is sort of pre sort of guideline really and pre um, a lot of the newer clinics that have now been set up to oversee this um, topic. So one patient, the obstetrician didn't know about it all and told me putting on weight will make my MS worse. I got more useful information off the MS Society website than from the obstetrician. And we're quite lucky as a condition, we've got some great charities out there, but we don't really want our patients to rely on those websites solely. So I think, you know, part of what I include now for everybody, um, sort of with the preconception counselling is okay, looking still at lifestyle, looking at sort of diet, sort of exercise, um, and see what needs to be amended 
what I'd like to sort of work on is producing sort of a tip sheet or um, uh, sort of a little booklet uh, alongside the physiotherapist. They can actually sort of go home with some exercises or amendments to sort of their plan for that sort of pregnancy period. So another quote, I have many new MS symptoms while pregnant, including existing symptoms flaring up. But when I asked for advice, I was often told that symptoms usually improve while pregnant and there wasn't anything that could really be done for the new symptoms unless I wanted to take a course of steroids. So again, you know, upon preconception counselling, very open and honest, you know, let's, let's talk about what the, what we believe to be sort of a pregnancy pathway in terms of lower risk for the first half of having symptoms, sort of high, sort of um, same risk sorry, for the first half of pregnancy, lower risk uh, where that immunoprotection kicks in and then slightly increased risk postpartum. We talk about sort of long-term prognosis, et cetera, and how, um, how actually sort of pregnancy doesn't have, a, have an overall negative um, impact on one's condition. Uh, but also, you know, talking about, okay, so what are potential triggers of symptoms? We then reiterate sort of on sort of heat and fatigue and other things that might be exacerbating things. But also, you know, these patients now might be on treatment. So again, is this patient on treatment or are they not on treatment? Do we need to talk about treatment? Do we need to talk about escalation of treatment? Do we need to be talking about getting them into our urgent access clinic for uh, assessment? So again, all of this, I think it's really good to sort of have build a rapport, be open and honest from the outset and to say, okay, well, overall people do well during pregnancy, fantastic. But actually for the minority, that isn't the case and people can still have symptoms. So I think it's really good to explore all possible pathways, a great pathway where you do really well, and they're not so good where people might be troubled by symptoms so they know they can access us and know what input that they can have and be provided with. Um, third point, sort of not sure it could have been improved, brilliant. Um, although with people, uh, although with people less informed, they were much more cautious with me, which meant I may have not been allowed a birthing centre experience, which is what I was keen to have and did have. So from the face, it looks like it's a lady that's probably already had a pregnancy. Um, and again, you know, we might sort of go through different options, uh, sort of water births, birthing centres, labour wards. But again, looking at that individual's um, sort of MS history and what they would be safe to do and working with the obstetric team. And I think my initial uh, sort of patient cohort that did the survey, I would probably say it was 50% the obstetric care at UCLH and probably 50% at other trusts. And I think there's been a shift in that now, whether it be through the pandemic, but I think a lot more people are, are accessing more local services. So I'd say there's probably sort of more higher percent that are now are having obstetric care of other trusts outside of UCLH. So for the next quote, the midwives were giving me con contradicting information. I was high risk, normal risk. I was, wasn't worried at the time, but it encouraged me to really go for a C-section as I was terrified at the time already but nurses and midwives not knowing about my MS made me a little scared. C-section meant I was guaranteed a doctor and a good more predictable care sort of through childbirth and, and again depending on if people have sort of other comorbidities kind of their physical restrictions from their MS but you know if they're unrestricted they're, they're in remission they've got no other comorbidities then generally we would deem them as a low risk pregnancy um, however, I do say that uh, at, at the trust, you know, it might be consultant led care, uh, so that might mean you have additional scans, but that's not a negative, you know, that's a positive, you're having more contact with your obstetric team. So just sort of putting it into context for them so they don't sort of have that anxiety and that sort of feeling of being scared. And sort of the other one talks again about the pros and cons of elective cesarean versus vaginal delivery. Um, and I think, again, sort of, you know, reassure them actually 90% of women go on to have a natural vaginal delivery. I think it's really important um, to be open up front with the obstetrics team. I always say to them, have a discussion about um, epidural and anaesthetics so that it's documented in your care notes. So that if, for example, you did have to have an epidural for pain relief or for a sort of C-section, you know, it's all there ready. So it's not gonna cause any delays on the day. It's better to have everything documented in advance so again, you know, we don't know the guaranteed path because babies have their own ideas as well. Um, so it's good to sort of have, have a bit of an idea and be a bit of an open mind, but all sort of possible outcomes. 
And then so finally, a bit about, bit about the, the communication, so for them to have access to my MS records, I had to explain everything over and over again. So again, we've now got uh, electronic healthcare systems, so patients can have their uh, medical notes, their letters, um, their recommendations from their care team at UCLH, sort of the National Hospital, that they can show their obstetric team if they're not under our care for their pregnancy. And again, more communication between consultants and more contact with the team at UCLH. And again, that's something that we are now able to offer to provide. We can link up with sort of other services if they want to talk to us about individual sort of circumstances. And I think it is really important. Um, I remember a lady whose main symptoms from S was, was really significant bladder and bowel dysfunction. And actually for her, a cesarean section was the right call. And we, we sort of worked with her care team to help facilitate that for her. So the key themes from that, we should discuss family planning and pregnancy proactively as early as possible. And I think that can be done from sort of any member of, of the healthcare team. Um, it's just getting talking about it. And, you know, even if they then come to me, so I had a lady that was referred to me a few months ago, said, oh, you know, I've been trying to conceive for a couple of years, uh, but actually they had never sort of intercourse there was many more sort of issues so I think if we ask the question um, and whether or not you know being a mum myself can be more open to talking about certain topics um, may sort of benefit from our sort of older male colleagues who knows but I think just asking the question anybody can do that and I think as early as possible um, improve communication across all care teams so something that we're all working on um, offer advice and support on family planning issues in MS and troubleshoot and provide up-to-date information and what can be a very confusing time whilst trying to navigate all the myths that exist surrounding pregnancy and MS. And just think for a lot of these patients, they're newly diagnosed as well. So they're not only having to sort of emotionally work through that process, but also sort of work through kind of the impact that this is sort of going to have. And I guess it sort of takes more of a sp spontaneous sort of aspect out of things. So, you know, things are more planned and often you know I'm the first person that somebody tells that they're pregnant so there is that element to it but I think you know being open and honest from the outset um, is, is a real key so topics outside of that and again this is not exhaustive um, that we sort of cover at the preconception counselling is obviously as Dr Chung sort of mentioned the disease modifying treatments and obviously this is a real key and I sort of see patients sort of weekly in an allocated sort of clinic for patients that are more complex and more discussion regarding treatments, then I have a monthly MDT with Dr. Chung. And then on the symptomatic treatment, I also have a monthly um, obstetric clinic, which I, again, I can either ask for advice for, or I can refer sort of into. So again, sort of very lucky to have sort of different, different windows um, to explore depending on the patient's needs. But I think with the disease modifying treatments, you know, as Dr. Chang alluded, you can have people that are really risk averse and you think historically, you know, people don't want to take sort of medications sort of for pregnancy, you might have the will of risk averse. And, you know, if they're going to not be on treatment, we, we don't know what their fertility is going to be like, and we know that potentially sort of 80% of women will fall pregnant within the first 12 months. Uh, so it can be, a, you know, and there's a high miscarriage rate, you know, 15%, you know, for, for the general population. So again, sort of talking through all of these sort of avenues. And I say, okay, well, if we, you know, if you're actively looking to conceive now, why don't we just try an injection? At least then you'll know you've tried it. If you tolerate it, great. If you don't, we can stop that. And then we kind of know that further down the line, that that's a treatment that we may not explore. So just sort of looking at the ones that potentially we do have more data on and there's a good safety profile and just sort of talking around all the potential sort of scenarios. And also, you know, touching on the potential side effects that the disease modifying treatments, um, for example, sort of hypothyroidism. So if they are pregnant, you know, are their team aware about sort of the blood sort of checking and the thyroxine levels? just to sort of make sure that they're safe on their sort of pregnancy um, sort of timeline. And then symptomatic treatment, again, you know, if people are really fatigued, you know, epidurals can be used as fatigue management, you know, conserve their energy in the early stages of labour so that they can, you know, have more energy for the active sort of pushing sort of phase, looking at sort of bladder dysfunction, talking about pelvic floors early, 
um, sort of looking at all the other symptomatic treatments um, that other people might sort of be on, if it's sort of pain management, um, sort of et cetera. So uh, again, you know, it's not ideal to, for them to stop all of their medications because actually, if we're looking at somebody's quality of life, but it's about being on the lowest effective dose. And we'd always sort of then get our advice from our obstetric colleagues for that. Vitamin D, uh, again, we would advise our sort of women to remain on the high dose vitamin D um, sort of throughout pregnancy. Again, it's one of the risk factors that we can sort of control and sort of in pregnancy. Smoking cessation, I think it's a real opportunity to bring this up. 10% uh, of pregnant women smoke. Um, so again, a lot of women kind of use this as the motivation for their MS because we know that again, in terms of prognostics for sort of progression, you know, this is a modifiable risk factor. And in terms of baby's health, so having those discussions early on, um, you know, that they can have nicotine replacement therapy, there's great sort of psychological support, but doing it as a combined, it will, you know, three times more likely to sort of make that quit attempt. So if you've got people that are saying, oh, I can do it on my own, uh, there's less chance of them sort of going through that. Um, and, you know, even talking to them about their partners, okay, do their partners smoke? Because even that can have an effect on sort of baby's birth weight, et cetera. Um, again, if they continue smoking and they need a C-section, it's about, you know, potential to delayed in wound healing or complications from anesthetic. There's lots of things to sort of talk about in terms of smoking cessation and pregnancy as well. Vaccines, a hot topic, uh, as we've all been living and breathing through the pandemic. And I, I did really feel for our sort of pregnant sort of cohort, um, just because it was very confusing advice not to have it and then to have it. Um, it the stance from UCLH has always been very pro-vaccine. And I think, you know, sadly, we, I think we've got two or three uh, sort of pregnant ventilator patients in ITU. Um, and that's sort of, that's, you know, the reason to, to prevent sort of these severe complications um, sort of from COVID. But again, it's sort of working with them, making sure that they're making informed decisions directing them to the Royal College of Obstetricians and Oncologists. They've got great Q&A on there. Um, just so that, you know, if they are sort of declining the vaccine, that they are sort of doing that with the most up-to-date information. Um, and again, you know, this sort of poor patient sort of cohort, you know, probably been isolated and they've kind of not had sort of the, the great sort of social setup that we would have had, um, you know, if we were sort of pregnant outside of the pandemic. So really do talk about the emotional side of things. Um, about sort of if they're on search you know, other medications to remain on that, talk about sort of postnatal depression and all of the support um, and the logistics sort of afterwards as well. And whether that be, you know, looking at sort of NCT classes or sort of baby groups and looking at the wider setup, um, you know, sort of family, sort of friends, talking about sort of logistics to restart treatment, for example. So if they're uh, on Tysabri, you know, working with them about when they can restart, are they breastfeeding? Okay, do we have to sort of talk about sort of expressing as well to allow them to attend for treatment? Do we sort of allow to suggest, again, sort of expressing so the partner can help with the nighttime feed? There's sort of so much, you know, in this sort of really vulnerable time for women where, you know, they've gone through the trauma of childbirth, they, um, it's obviously her, it's a new routine, especially if you're a first time mum, uh, you've got the sleep deprivation, all of these sort of things. So I think you know, what I sort of tend to do in terms of my clinic is would follow them up then sort of postpartum until they're either uh, sort of up to 12 months or back onto their existing treatment or sort of as and when sort of is needed. And I think I'm overrunning. So I don't know if I have time to properly discuss this case study, but I'll just sort of briefly um, sort of go through it. because I think it is really important to discuss again sort of postpartum relapse plans and, and just sort of talk to sort of women because so we don't have that crystal ball we can't say for you this is going to go one way and even if you know with the new generation of treatments it's people still may you know have have sort of relapses so this lady 27 year old relapsed in writing MS onset 2011 and again not surprising I tried on a different array of medications Capaxonab and Extec for Dira. And then she escalated to alentuzumab after um, sort of new um, sort of lesions on imaging. So she had two cycles, 2018, 2019, and had her first child in the November of 2020. Um, however, we do, I do try to coordinate sort of imaging in that three to six months sort of postpartum. She had some imaging done and uh, the MRI showed a new lesion. 
Uh, and then we were in regular contact. She was really sort of struggling. She'd had, she had sort of a relapse in sort of the March. We saw her in our urgent access clinic. Um, we then, she was, she was breastfeeding and she wanted to exclusively breastfeed until, until the child was about one. And she was quite keen on this. Um, so we started the Bravia. We're still really struggling, was having, you know, struggling sort of her legs giving way when she was pushing the push chair, uh, struggling sort of with the neuropathic pain. And again, we didn't, she didn't really want to take the risk of starting something for that um, in terms of sort of breastfeeding as well. So she was then decided, right, well, I'm going to try and wean breastfeeding. Her case was discussed at our MDT. And then we proceeded with a cycle three of anamtuzumab sort of earlier this month. Um, during that admission, she had the P imaging as well. Um, and again, there was sort of new lesions sort of evident um, sort of on that sort of MRI. So to conclude, you know, we have got a large number of DMTs available now, which is, which is amazing. Fantastic for, for sort of our young sort of childbearing cohort. And I think there's a real drive to standardise clinical practice. We're all here today to talk about how we're sort of incorporating things in our practice and about sort of shared learning. And ultimately what this will do is it'll improve patient outcomes, increase patient satisfaction. Um, so I think, you know, having these open discussions on this webinar is, is really great. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your time today. And again, reiterating Dr. Chung's point about sort of the new MS Pregnancy Register, which will hopefully not have an effect on our current patients, but will guide sort of our future thoughts and practice. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Lucy. This is an excellent talk. And, and thank you very much for highlighting the importance of preconception counselling. Um, and thank you also for sharing uh, your patients' th thoughts about how they felt um, about the, the, their care during pregnancy. Uh, so that, that's, that's, that's really um, excellent. Thank you so much. I'd like to welcome Sarah White. Uh, Sarah is a senior uh, MS specialist nurse, um, works at St. George's. Um, Sarah's got a, an extensive um, experience on the collaboration between MS uh, and the maternity care. So thank you so much, Sarah, for coming and sharing your experience with us. Um, I'll let you take over. Thanks. Um, well, hello, everyone. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you to the Neuro Academy for asking me to speak as well. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about our combined maternal medicine and MS service um, that we set up a few years ago. Um, some, some of it will be fairly similar to what Lucy's spoken about, but um, um, you'll see how we do it at St George's. So just before we um, look at it, this was a Danish study that was published in 2018, looking at family planning awareness amongst people with MS. And it showed approximately 50% of patients who had had children after their diagnosis um, felt inadequately informed about treatment options during conception um, or, and after conception during pregnancy. And also at least half of them didn't know whether DMTs actually could have affect the fetus. Um, and so that really backs up what Lucy was saying in her survey that um, many uh, people aren't well informed. Um, and you know, we have a responsibility to make sure our patients um, are informed. And so our service was actually born out of a complaint from a patient who said her MS was not taken into consideration during her labour or while she was on the maternity ward. And so um, I got together with the uh, lead um, midwife because we obviously needed to look at well, what could we do better. And our epilepsy service already ran a joint clinic and we could already see the benefits that um, that was um, giving to the patients. And we thought, well, we could do something similar. So we set up um, our um, uh, service. This is a condensed pathway because otherwise I couldn't all fit it on one screen. So the patient um, will inform the MS team, hopefully, uh, that they are pregnant. And the first question we obviously have to think about is, are they on DMT? And if they are, were they meant to be when they got pregnant? If they're not, we'd obviously advise them to stop. Um, if they are, you know, and there's been some preconception counselling and, and the, the, you know, they, they were 
they deliberately got pregnant, it wasn't by mistake. Um, then obviously that there may be a plan to continue with what they're already taking. Um, we obviously need to consider whether we need to fill in a yellow card if, it, if it's a, a DMT that they shouldn't be on whilst pregnant. And we, uh, this is the third plug for the UKMS Pregnancy Register we've had today, but we also now are encouraging patients to join the register. It's um, a study to better understand the potential effects of exposure to uh, medication in women with MS uh, who become pregnant. Uh, and they'll, the study will also be following these women through until the child turns five. So we're really encouraging women to, to join the register so that we can find out more about uh, the effect of these drugs. Um, we'll add the patient to our, our patient database and also we have a pregnancy database. Um, and then they will um, book in and see uh, a midwife between eight and 14 weeks, and then they'll follow the normal maternal medicine pathway. And at this point, the midwife always checks with us, do we know that our patient with MS is actually pregnant? Um, so that's sort of the second point where we, we just make sure we, we are aware. Um, and then when the patient is between 28 and 34 weeks gestation, we have a combined clinic where the MS nurse and the midwife that's caring for this patient will have a joint review. Um, and uh, we go through a number of things, which um, I will just go through here. So some of these things Lucy's already mentioned. So we're looking at the birth plan. It, will, will there need to be any um, special considerations, perhaps because of spasticity um, with position? So we're, we're looking at that with the midwife. We're talking about the postpartum relapse risk. Have they got a plan in place? Do they, have they got people around them that can support them if they should have a relapse um, during that postpartum period? Um, we're looking at breastfeeding. We might want to refer them to the breastfeeding counsellor at this point um, before um, the baby is born. Um, we have a, a specialist OT that will look at um, things like um, uh, sling support to help if the, if the woman has got perhaps um, arm weakness so they can have a special sling to hold their baby in while they're breastfeeding. We'll talk about the, the thought about storing breast milk as well in the freezer um, so that if they have a period where they've got severe fatigue, that um, they've got breast milk to fall back on. So we'll talk about all of those things around breastfeeding. Um, we talk about postpartum support plan and what's that looking like for them uh, and making sure they have got support in place. And then we're looking at symptom management. Um, uh, Lucy covered some of these things, but we're looking at um, their bladder. So frequency and urgency can temporarily increase because of the pressure of the uterus. Um, we need to make sure the patients are, um, are aware that UTIs um, are more prevalent in pregnancy. So just to be vigilant and be aware for the symptoms, because we all know that um, MS symptoms can be worse while, some, uh, while someone's got a UTI. We look at mobility, particularly uh, during later pregnancy, where the, the increasing weight of the baby might have a uh, have caused extra problems with their mobility and posture, and particularly obviously if that was already a problem beforehand. Looking at sleep, sleep can be a problem in pregnancy, fatigue. Um, now we all, all know that fatigue can be worse in early pregnancy, um, but uh, you know patients sometimes get don't realise that it's because of that and not because um, uh, it's not purely because their MS fatigue is worse. Um, depression, we always ask the, um, the patient if they had a problem, if they've already had a pregnancy before, did they have a problem, problem with postnatal depression? Uh, we had one lady that uh, broke down in tears actually and said she'd actually, she'd had postnatal depression in her first pregnancy, had never told anyone. Um, this was the first time she told anyone. She used to go down to the end of the garden, have a cry, and then go back into the house. 
So we just need to be vigilant that, you know, this could happen again and, and just make sure that we've got the support in place should it happen. Um, domestic abuse and depression is increased in that first year postpartum. So that's just something to be aware of. And from the latest Embrace figures, um, which are um, uh, figures are, are published every year, 13% um, of all women that died up to the first year after pregnancy died as a result of a mental health condition. And that's obviously something that we really have, have an impact on. And then we we'll also look at their DMT plan um, for the rest of their pregnancy. Um, so, for, for example, if they're on TASAB, we'll be thinking about this point about taking them off um, in that last trimester. And then um, thinking about what the plans are for, for um, DMT postpartum um, and in that breastfeeding phase. So we're looking at all of those things. Um, and also um, other services we might link them into. So um, the Disabled Parents Network, REMAP, which is, for those of you who don't know, an organisation that um, is run by volunteers and will custom make equipment for people. We had uh, an amazing um, adjustment to uh, a pram for a patient a few years ago, which was really good. Um, and then there are online groups like um, Mums UK. So um, that we're looking at all of those things during that appointment. I think the benefits of the clinic is that it's um, individualising care um, and taking MS symptoms and treatment into account at all stages of the pregnancy. And we're working collaboratively with the um, uh, midwifery team. And I think the other big thing that we've learned is that the MS nurses and midwives have learned so much from each other. Um, we really have, um, I think both feel very much more well informed to be able to help our, our patients. So just thinking about how you might be able to put this into practice. Now, I, I'm obviously aware that not all of you are going to be able to have a joint clinic. You might actually work in the community and, and not have um, access to uh, uh, mid midwifery service in the same way. But ask your patient for details of their named with midwife so that you can share information with, with each other. Perhaps arrange to review your patient between 28 and 34 weeks and think about those things um, I spoke about earlier. And that is what we do for patients that don't actually have the maternal care at St George's, because obviously we have patients that have it at other hospitals, so we would, we would do that for them. Find out the contact details for your infant feeding team, the safeguarding with midwife, um, and the um, midwife for um, mental health problems. So make sure you, kn you know um, who, who those are, um, because then if you do need them nearer the, you know, at the time of seeing someone, you'll know who they are. Um, and find out the details of your birth reflections and debrief service. So every uh, maternity service has um, something called birth reflections or a debrief service. So for those patients that perhaps have a traumatic birth or just want to talk through what happened, um, so make sure you know where to refer to if you need to. Um, just that awareness of the increased risk of domestic abuse and depression. You know, if a patient doesn't turn up for clinic and starts, um, uh, you know, um, being not responsive on the phone, um, use that as a red flag because it may be that they're disengaging with the service because of depression or because something else is going on at home. So be persistent and and make sure you follow these people up. Familiarise yourself with pregnancy consensus guidelines, which have already been uh, mentioned. They're really um, very concise and straightforward. They're very helpful. Um, and then finally, obviously, consider setting up a joint clinic. And I'm very happy if anyone wants to contact me um, just for me to help them with how they might go about that. So thank you for listening. That's what all I was going to see, say, and I'll just hand back over to Asla now. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah, for the excellent talk. And uh, thank you very much for sharing your really excellent experience in collaborative work between MS and maternity services. 
Excellent. So we now have time for questions. Um, I will start off with um, Dr. Chung. Um, there's a question asking about how do you manage the restriction of blue tech commissioning criteria uh, in these cases? I think this is referring back to the example that you've you've discussed. So this patient obviously is now on Fingolimod. Um, so how can we justify prescribing that elizumab? Mm. Thank you. Um, hi, Rachel. Thank you. Great question. Um, so what we do, what I do, is um, we take these cases to our departmental MDT, where it's attended by at least um, at least three, three, often more consultants, but we're a big centre, and uh, one of the neuropharmacists and one of the nurses. And using this example, um, we would go back to her, you know, retrospectively go back to her pre-DMT sort of criteria. So in this case, she met original criteria for natalizumab. She came up with for other reasons than usually, but you know, it'll be consensus of the MDT that given family planning, um, you know, would it be suitable? And usually if we re apply retrospectively, it, we would mostly agree it's suitable. And we've also done that with, uh, for example, cladribin going back to, let's say someone's on Tecfidera, um, you know, we'll go back to their pre tecfidera um, activity, relapses and MRI. And if they meet, if they had met criteria for cladribin then, then usually the consensus will be okay to, to go ahead. If they don't, then, then they don't. Um, yeah, so that's what we do case by case. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Karen. Um, there's a question to Lucy. Um, uh, you mentioned that males who haven't gone through childbirth could shy away from this topic. <laughs> Probably not for everyone. Um, do you think this is an area where more education is needed, um, specifically tailored for males or those who feel less confident um, to discuss this in, in, in depth? Yeah, really good question. That probably that was quite a flippant comment of mine just to sort of put into that sort of presentation there. Um, but I think often you are more confident if you have more experience and exposure. So it probably is just more an element of, of exposure. So I guess, you know, the the sort of education that one might think of it is is the information that you talk through with your patients so they everybody knows you know kind of what what topics might be on someone's mind um and feeling sort of happy to talk about um you know sort of looking start sort of family uh, history of miscarriages uh, you know fertility sort of age um and just then the the logistics of, of pregnancy um and sort of labor itself so probably more um like I said, if you haven't been through it, it, more sort of just sort of knowing what that process involves so that, you know, when patients bring it up or if they sort of choose to bring it up, there's a bit more um, openness and a bit more understanding uh, of what that looks like for um, pathway. Thanks, Lucy. Um, so it, it just, just to refer back to your services in Queen Square, so the preconception counselling, do you also involve male, males with MS or is it just tailored to, to, for, for women? Within that. Really good question. It's, it's, it's a new service. It's only been sort of set up last year, sort of in the midst of the pandemic. So, um, you know, it, it's kind of telephone and video at the moment. And I guess predominantly it's, it's sort of women. So rather than just having an ad hoc patient sort of contacts us to say that they've had a positive test or a GP kind of lets us know that they're, um, you know, had a positive test, it's this more formalised sort of structured environment. Um, but you're right, especially with some of our drugs. Cladrine, for example, you know, it does uh, affect sort of the male as well. So that is something that we are looking to incorporate. So obviously, you know, uh, women that sort of get referred, we do it sort of with their partners. Um, and I have spoken to only one male um, regarding sort of the issue, but maybe that's something that I need to sort of verbalise and say that people can refer into. Yeah. OK, and it's just really kind of trying to support our also young males into, into the process of decision making as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, there's another um, question for you, Lucy, um, uh, asking if you don't mind sharing uh, any paperwork uh, when you've established the service in U UCL to help with um, uh, pe other people establishing the same service um, elsewhere, um, if, that's, if that's okay with you, for preconception counselling. Yeah, certainly. And I think um, Dr. Chung and I sort of did a separate business case for uh, also part of the same business case. So perhaps we could put our heads together and see what we can share in terms of MS Academy and, and sort of what what was the evidence for setting up the, the service? Because I think that's sort of 
what we need to justify is we need to make to, to say, well, this is a service that is needed for X, Y, and Z. So we can certainly sort of share that information. Sure. Um, and, and maybe there's a question for, for both Lucy and Karen. When, when do you think is the best time to start this conversation? When, when, when do you think? Is it at the time of diagnosis or do you book a separate um, appointment to discuss this? Because that's quite a really, you know, it's a lengthy discussion and, and quite sensitive. I mean, patients, they, they're very overwhelmed about the diagnosis itself, let alone making these decisions about family planning. Um, I can maybe go for that. Um, I personally, at a time of discussing DMTs, is quite a good introduction because um, you know, most patients appreciate that drugs may have an effect on fertility or pregnancy. Um, but I think as Lucy and Sarah both said, it's all about proactively talking about it. So I only look after adult patients, so, so therefore it's relevant. But, you know, you have... 18, 19 year olds coming with their parents and they may be a bit completely mortified. I mentioned this in fact, but, um, but it's all about planting the seed. It's about the idea that this is something that when you come to this life, this juncture of your life, we need to think about. And I probably sometimes overdo it where every time I <laughs> ask them, but, um, but I think it's, it's an ongoing discussion and it's all about raising their awareness that is necessary. Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, and there's another question saying, uh, do many patients from Harriet, as a result of their diagnosis, decide not to have children in your experience? Personally, I, I for my exposure, um, I can think of a few women that are seriously considering that between the two options, uh, they tended to be sort of the the older uh, sort of age group um so generally we sort of advise okay well why don't you sort of look at you know get tested sort of look at your egg quality look at your egg reserve kind of see what the chances are and then you can be guided about time and so if they're looking at a treatment that might be 18 that they can conceive in 18 months versus sort of something that can start sooner it will help sort of guide their decision um so i, I think the majority do continue to to sort of achieve those life goals um for for the majority i don't know sort of about yourself dr chang but i think so for me I think the majority sort of do yeah, yeah I, I agree i think most do i've had one patient who stopped at one and if it's not for her ms she will have more but she i think she's quite happy you know it's it was a tough decision but she came to it with her with her partner i don't know sarah what do you what do you see? Um, uh, yeah, I, I can just think of one case, the same actually. It had one child and then um, was um, considering, she, she, she'd she already already um, had to Sabri and had to come off it for, for a, a particular reason and was offered Lemtrada and was, um, sorry, not Lemtrada, Ocrevus and was, uh, yeah really considering, well, you know, do I go ahead with this or do I have another baby? And, and uh, she was so worried about another relapse and disability that she she chose to, to just stick with one child and then go on with D, uh, her DMT. But actually for most, I think, I think you're right. The conversation needs to start really early um, because then you give the patients more opportunity to have a think about their family planning and and um, working around their DMT, uh, and for the vast majority of women, um, they they do go, you know, they they go on and have you know babies take precedence, and you know that's yeah. a you know that's a huge important part of someone's life. So, yeah, I, I agree. Thank you, Sarah. Um, there's a question for you, Sarah. Um, how what barriers do you find when, when you were setting up your service? Um, we actually had very little barrier because we were modeling it. So first of all, we were proactively trying to do something following a complaint. We were modeling it on an existing service within St. George's, the epilepsy service. And the one thing everyone was worried about was uh, the capacity for a clinic room. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we literally said, well, that's fine. We'll just add one on to the beginning of our, our MS nurse clinics as and when we need to see someone that's pregnant, because obviously, you know, it's not happening every week. Um, and therefore, 
um, that there really weren't any other barriers. Um, the, the, you know, the, the midwifery team were very keen um, to, to uh, go down that road. So no, we didn't actually have many, many barriers at all. Well, that's that's um, very reassuring. I may add, I'm delighted to hear that, Sarah. I think we had a little bit more barrier than we would hope. Um, maybe we need to complain. Um, so just, a, just to, to mirror on that theme is, um, so Lucy's been doing this role for a bit longer, but it was only in April this year that we had a first sort of joint monthly clinic with myself involved with slightly more complex patients. But the reason I said there wasn't a sort of significant barrier, but if it was up to me and Lucy, we will have like a, a parallel clinic with, with a midwife um, with, you know, actual obstetric um, involvement then and there. Mm -hmm. So it's a sort of one-stop shop. Um, in, in my dream world, that may even replace one of the antenatal clinic appointments, or, you know, it'll be great for the patients. But um, uh, that became just too complicated to, to negotiate between the different departments. And I think UCLA just also, you know, exceptional in the sense that we have a different site. The two buildings are you know, about a kilometer apart. So in the end, we gave up on that, didn't we, Lucy? We just we just um, carved out um, work. You know, I dropped one MS clinic per month, which didn't really impact on the service significantly. Um, we just carved out our existing time and then just sort of said, oh, that's when we could do it. Um, but luckily, because Lucy liaised with the obstetric team, we have that as a, as a resource. So is, yeah, I think different trusts will have different... Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're fortunate that obviously we're all on one site, so that makes already makes it a bit easier. And actually, we are replacing one of their midwifery appointments um, because um, we, we're fitting it into to a time point because we don't we don't really want to give the pa patient an extra visit because, you know, you're, exactly. you're trying to you're trying to streamline care. So it, 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 you know, it doesn't really doesn't hasn't been a problem, but. I can understand if you're on two different sites as well, that makes it a little bit more complicated. Well, that's really excellent. And Karen, so do you do a joint clinic with the obstetricians or is it yourself and, and Lucy? No, so we, what we try to do was um, get a room next to the obstetrician clinic so we can dip in and out. Um, <coughs> and likewise, you know, for, for them to come and talk to us, but it was proving too, too difficult. It also, to be fair, was during lockdown. No one knew what the recovery would be like. So it's something maybe we'll consider again. At the moment, it's still sort of in a pilot phase. And I think so far, the feedback has been good. Yeah. Been good. Oh, that, that's really interesting because in Sheffield, we, myself and Dr. Tessa Bonnet, is also, we've also established the service. Um, luckily, we've really had no barriers. Um, we've been very well supported by both the obstetric and, and neurology department. So at the moment, we're running a preconception clinic jointly with, with Dr. Tessa Bonnet. She's a consultant obstetrician and then a monthly joint um, antenatal clinic. But yeah, we're doing pr pretty much similar to you, Karen, is that we're trying to just see them in our MS clinic as an addition really to, to, to our uh, regular patients because it's obviously difficult to, to, to arrange. But it's different, it's different models, but it's, it's all, it's, the whole theme is really, um, it's just to try and make sure these patients are seen appropriately and, and they get the right support. Um, and I guess my, my, my really question is, how do we see this MS maternity collaborative work in the, in the next few years? How, how do we, how do you think? Um, because this is such an, such an important um, part now. I mean, we, there's a growth in the um, DMTs now available for MS. It makes our conversations with patients more, more challenging as new drugs are coming through. So, so what, how, do you see, how do you see that in, in the next few years? This is actually to, to all of you, really. <laughs> well, I, I would hope it's going to continue to get better. You know, hopefully the people listening to this webinar will go away and have a think about if they're not already doing something, what they could do to improve that collaboration with maternal ser medicine services. So I would hope it is going to improve. And I think we need um, to lean on each other's expertise in this area. Um, so, yeah. That would be my hope. Yeah. And from my perspective, I'm trying to arrange um, some shadowing of also the, the specialist team working in the fertility sort of clinic at UCH as well to gain a bit more of an understanding around that. Could we sort of set up uh, sort of our own sort of referral pathways if we're then sort of discussing sort of issues with patients? 
um, and they are having trouble conceiving, is there sort of something that we can then sort of like be sort of linking to ourselves other than having to sort of go via the GP sort of in that route. Um, and yet just sort of embedding kind of what we're doing at the moment, well, although it is set up, um, you know, it has sort of been set up in the pandemic um, and just sort of, you know, ironing all out. So at the moment I also, uh, sort of sit in on the obstetric neurology clinic but again that's sort of more um it's not just ms patients it's all neurology yeah. patients and mm. um, so like i said sort of maybe we could work so that there is uh, more of an mdt just sort of an ms mdt with with karen myself and an obstetrician or uh, midwife um further down the line just to streamline everything like sarah mentioned um but otherwise for us it tends to tends to work quite well and I think we did a snapshot last year, Karen, we thought we had about 80 patients. And then sort of fast forward to August now, we've got 180. So definitely now that, you know, people are aware um, of the services set. Yeah. People yeah. Con yes. So, yeah, that's all very exciting. Um, another question has come up. Has anyone linked with fertility services for patients needing support to get pregnant uh, and what would you advise um, and this can include the group of patients who take years to get pregnant mm -hmm. that, that's an excellent question um, that's a really good question um, um, so I may take that so I it's difficult um, if they you know fulfill NHS criteria for fertility investigation and treatment then um, usually a GP will have referred them um, and at this point usually they may then have a, they may get referred to me or Lucy, um, and we may have, you know, a general chat about the, you know, fertility. And a lot of women have questions about fertility treatment, you know, gonadotrophin agonists and antagonists, whether that has a, you know, uh, impact on MS. And what I say to them is, it's anecdotal. You know, there, there's some anecdotal report of relapses when the people go through either the antagonistic or antagonist, you know, when they induce or suppress the hormones for fertility treatment. But but overall, by the time they get to that stage, they, they want to conceive, they want to have a child. And I always say, I wouldn't let that affect your decision. But perhaps what Lucy is saying where we can directly, um, you know, refer them will, will be nice to sort of take a middleman out of the way. Um, for those who don't have NHS criteria, who want to freeze their eggs because they don't know about the future then um it's a little bit more difficult because that's all private and you know all i say is well you can take my clinic letter to, to whoever you see and they're more than welcome to to write to us for further information and liaising yeah yeah so that that's also uh, another important topic as we now um are using more stem cell therapy um you know it's, it's a similar context of trying to establish the links with the gynecology team and, and a pathway to refer these patients as well um, so that's that's excellent this is all what we have i think we're coming now to the end of our webinar i'd really like to thank um the speakers um for joining us today for this really exciting discussion really exciting um we know that for women with um, with ms um, choosing um you know and planning a family is a, is a really momentous decision it comes with uh, a lot of added consideration so it's a really important um topic that i hope that you know our services will stand to expand and, and, and get better and better for our patients so i'd really like to thank the sponsors Roche for sponsoring this webinar and thank all the ms academy team for uh, organizing this um, if um, the audience have having any questions please um, post them through the website and we'll uh, try and answer them and, 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 and send you back the answers okay so have a good afternoon everyone um, bye for now thank you Asa. thank you everyone Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.